I think as you grow older as an artist, you make this sort of lexicon of experience and materials. And now, you know, in my 50s, it's really great to be able to use all of that information and pluck out from it and decide what, what it is that you need and want. You know, I don't know if I could have made this work if I hadn't had the retrospective a couple of years ago. I think that was really a key point where I was able to look at 30 years of work and just think, hmm, this is kind of, this is what I've done, so what's the next step? I really wanted to make the opposite of what I've been making. That was the starting point. I felt like I was a sort of chrysalid or something and I was trying to kind of get out of and try and work out what this thing was. And I just think, I just kept writing down, it's the opposite. It's the opposite I want to do. What is the opposite? So. Wow. That is it's a shock. Kind of different. That's astonishing. So this one is called Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take it in for a minute. <laughs> so, for someone wow. who's known my work as long as you have, it's wow, quite a surprise. Is, it is shocking, actually, yeah. <gasps> That's extraordinary. In a good way, I hope. Yes, yeah. Do you know, it, it's made me realise for the first time that everything that you've done in the past has been complete and solid. Sort of hermetic, yeah. That's amazing, because the previous works, they're quite monolithic and they're impermeable. They've yeah. got this internal autonomy, mm. whereas this is utterly permeable and it's been ripped through and you get the feeling of forces of nature, yeah. of it being open to the world and yeah. ravaged by the world. Wow. I was trying to sort of make it feel catastrophic. I was thinking about everywhere that I'd been. I also always go to the edges of places yes, and, and yeah. look around the edges and, and try and find the sort of under the carpet, you know, what, what, what's going on in a place. So I've got thousands of pictures of shacks and sheds and buildings and places in distress. Lots and lots of things that have happened throughout my life and my sort of visual memory. This absolutely locates it in the temporal world of phenomena and chaos, yeah. these materials. Where did you find them? There was a shed from Norfolk. There was some materials I brought back from Wales at the beginning of the lockdown. There was materials that I got from out of skips. I just wanted to use rubbish. So it was all about just finding and then giving it a purpose, repurposing it. You know, I've always been a sort of magpie and like the way in which, you know, it's almost sort of alchemy, the way materials can change through elemental effect. I think this was the sort of first thing that I kind of sort of painted and put up on the wall and just thought, hang on, this is actually doing something. I'm struck by all the objects that you pick up are residues of architecture or things like these wonderful um, cans and so forth. But they're never the human presence itself. Why is that? Why is the human figure absent from your work? The closest I've got to the sort of human is probably the beds and the hot water bottles you know, feeling like you're preserving the sort of breath of the bed or all of those things which have a sort of human relationship. You know, furniture is always a sort of stand-in for a human presence and that's what I, you know, I realised early on when I first made closet and mantle and shallow breath and torso that you could use these things to create an absence and it's always been about absence rather than presence. Yeah. Things like very early works where you picked up mattresses that had just been tossed out on the street. And looking at them, they've got this really anthropomorphic quality. Yeah. They look human. 
I did pick up mattresses in the street. I think about it now. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally kind of grossed out by it. But, you know, early on, I just thought, oh, you know, it'd be all right. You take something quite abject yeah. and then elevate it. You give it a kind of dignity and a resonance and you release its history. You know, I started working on this probably two and a half years ago. So it was before the pandemic. And I had been making these sculptures called shy sculptures, which are these concrete buildings that are all over the world. There's one on an island in New York. There's one in a park in Norfolk. There's one in a forest in Yorkshire. There's one in Norway. You know, it is about the journey and about going to find them. And that was something that I always loved about land art. You know, the way things kind of disappeared. And, and the, the way they be, will get taken over by nature eventually. Yes. Do you think there's a kind of symbolic resilience about that as well, that even though they're quite fragile and they looked temporary yeah. and peripheral, yeah. they abide? Yes, you know? absolutely. It defies a single perspective. It makes you keep walking around yeah. and finding all these incidents, visual incidents. So this is really a huge paradigm shift. It's a really enthralling work of art. Good. In a wayward place, thin, delinquent trees of that awkward age loitered on the rotten ground. Fungi convened and conferred. Inebriated ruins, drunk on bathtub gin, had fallen gracelessly into the bramble scrub. Their tiles scattered their underwear exposed shamelessly. Bricks akimbo. While wood lice, who each carries its ancientness like shame, fiddled down in a ruined past. Birds muttered in shut eggs. The sky was alarming. It still is. Go to the margins. Look up. We are nowhere to be found. This is the first work in the exhibition. They're both papier-mâché cast from corrugated iron. The papier-mâché is always made from all the detritus from my life. I like the way they have the shapes of flags, but they're kind of blank. They do feel like flags. So the paper is notes and stuff like that. Notes from my work, it's my kids' homework, maybe <laughs> stuff that... <laughs> Not their actual homework. <laughs> Not their actual homework. No, but you know, one of my children's left school, so some of his school books got it, you know. I just collected all this stuff. Yeah. I thought, what am I going to do with it? Mm. And, and just started to make it into material. Right. And it felt like a kind of interesting way of making an extension of my sort of domestic life. Yeah, so they've got time in them. Yeah, beautiful. This piece is called Poltergeist, which has a sort of obvious reference to a piece that I made a long time ago called Ghost, which was the first room piece that I yeah. made. About three years ago, I went to the desert in California and there were these shacks everywhere and lots of ghost towns and it really felt like bones and fossils and that was the main sort of inspiration for actually really kind of getting to grips with these two works both poltergeist yeah. and doppelganger. The corrugated iron a lot of it is so sort of rusted it almost becomes like lace. Yes kind of see-through almost. Yeah and a lot of the what are called shotgun shacks out there were mended with lids from tin cans right. and jars and so it's something that I incorporated into right. this but also just bringing in bits of stuff from my garden you know right. I've made a lot of works with impressions on cardboard so they were made in cardboard then in wax then in bronze and then I've hand painted them in a way I was thinking about what's left behind after a flood and the sort of residues you know, I love the way you get this kind of detail, you know, where it really feels it's amazing. like it's cardboard. It really does. 
and then there are the resin works. I've made a lot of works with windows, but this is actually a, a notice board. This feels like the notices on this notice board are like the scraps of paper in the paper mache and yeah. the flags, and are like the twigs from your garden. It's the yeah. same instinct, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, yeah. I recognise that process, though. <laughs> yeah. Somebody was asking me about my writing process, and I, I think it's a bit like composting. There's always material. I'm always making material or finding material. And it's, it's more about sort of putting enough time into that material yeah. and then to start to shape it. Yeah. And the way you layer things with music feels very... Yeah, you're sort of building up yeah. strata. Yeah. yeah.
A lot of artists are very sensitive and you absorb all this information to sort of see into the future in a way. You're capturing, filtering through the kind of world's catastrophes yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And we're all so used to having 24-hour news coverage now and looking at your phone in the middle of the night when you wake up. There would just be explosions of chaos happening around the world. And if it's not a sort of tsunami or an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, there was something terrible happening in Syria. And I'm an emotional sponge. Did you know that this was going to be in such a state of collapse or was it structurally more whole? No, I knew I wanted it to be in a state of collapse. What I love about this also is the strength of these little attachments like this wooden, you know, that's the yeah. sort of thing that you might get on, a, yeah, on an old on toilet yeah. privy door yeah. or something. Yeah. And, and I love the fact that it's so humble and yet it survives. I always remember as a kid, there were sort of porter cabins everywhere, you know, these sort of post-war buildings. Yes, little, yeah. And if you broke into them, which we used to do as kids because they were endlessly fascinating, you'd go in and the floor was always spongy. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, and that was basically nature beginning to take over. It was sort of breaking it down. And, yeah. Does of... that interest you, the idea of entropy? You know, that kind of Robert yes. Smith's yeah, idea yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. things unwinding, yeah. decomposing? What I thought was interesting about this was to stop that, you know, mm. to stop it in time and just present it. I mean, the floor is impregnated with resin. You know, and I was thinking about whether or not I wanted people to walk into it or not. And then the presence of these organic elements, particularly roots and branches, you sort of feel actually life will continue. Yeah. Yeah. You've got two kind of foundational artworks that we've seen in the other work. One is by Piero della Francesca, oh. the baptism of the Christ, and the other is a Jericho, Raft of the Medusa polar opposites in yeah. many ways. One yeah. is all about serenity and calm, and the other is about like the sublime in a way and, and suffering and catastrophe. Someone like Piero has, has been with me f forever, actually, as far as I can ever remember. I think for sort of composition and, and the sort of quietness and the poetry, you know, it was when perspective was really clunky and it was just sort of awkward, quite sort of childlike in a way, but, you know, very serene and sublime. But with Doppelganger, I wanted to sort of open it up more and I was sort of trying to think of things that had had tragedies or, you know, a breakdown of society or some elemental disaster. And this painting, Raft of the Medusa, came to mind. And then I kind of brought it into the studio and just made a little model kind of using that as a sort of reference point. I suppose in a way the environmental aspect of what you do is symbolic in those two pieces in Poltergeist and Doppelganger. It's almost as if out of that apocalypse there is something perhaps hopeful in the way that you know how they say nature can revive so quickly mm. and it will outlive us. Yes, yeah. Despite all our best efforts to destroy yeah. it, yeah. it will yeah. it will survive, you know. And I think Although there's a sense of violence in this, undoubtedly, and um, perhaps mourning mm. and fury, at the same time, the presence of these organic elements, these bits of branches, gives you that... Hope. That gives you hope, yeah. yeah. Implicit in it is the idea of new growth, yeah. so I think that's a powerful statement. I think also because you enter a space of a white reed show expecting something incredibly still, and meditative, and this is quite the opposite. To be witness to it, it's thrilling, I have to say.